Cyber.com and I'm here with Jay Couch of Couch Engineering and he's outside of Denver and I had the pleasure of going to visit him uh, about a month ago and see some of his Unimogs. It was fantastic and we went for a drive and Jay scared the shit out of me not because he's a great driver because he is an ex-race driver in these Unimogs but because these things stick to the road better than anything else you've probably ever been on and so you can handle really rough terrain and go fast but safe and Zoe was I was really impressed with how like smooth and quiet and well these things drove down the road so Jay tell us some more about like you and how you got Hanita Mahogs and you know what you do at Couch Engineering it's cool that you brought that up too because that's always the misconception with the Unimox it's uh yeah it's a tractor it goes too slow well we fix that problem so um I've been doing I've been doing Unimog since I was uh, 19 and I'm 51 now so I've got a lot started with mountain biking then it got to small vehicles little cute off-road GP things, Suzuki's of course, Japanese, but then I had to carry a lot more gear, uh, and I would jump from Samurai straight into Unimogs back in 89. So I've been doing it for a long time to know what not to do, and probably over the last decade finally got it all figured out. So what we've been doing with the, we choose the Unimog is a, uh, it's just the best off-road platform for like an expedition truck. And, and why is that? What makes the Unimog, you know, so spectacular as an expedition vehicle? So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you need to take into account. This. The number one negative is going to be size. They're big. If you're going to have your house, I've never heard of anybody in a really, really, really tiny house that goes down a Jeep trailer. So if you're full time living in a machine that is going to be able to handle the elements, you know, extreme cold, heat, this, that, be able to carry 100 gallons of water, toilet, yada, yada. It's hard on a Jeep, it's hard on a Tacoma, man. They're just not gonna, you're gonna be so limited where you can go overloading your rig like that, that it kind of ruins it. So there's one thing, you've got the size, which it can easily handle whatever weight you need to throw at. We try to make it as light as possible. A turnkey truck, we target 18,000 pounds, like one behind me. That's full loaded, yada yada. And yet it's it's really weight carrying capacity is at least 10,000 over that, isn't it? We could, yeah. it, it'll vary. I could go another 4,000 over. It all depends on how that specific Unimog was, was built at the factory. And we could also do some modifications then. But the thing is, the gross vehicle weight rating of Unimog is gross weight, maximum weight, fully off-road rate. That's not going down the highway. It's a totally different deal. You look at a military truck, I want to say that uh, you'll have a three, call it a three-ton truck, off-road rated, is going to be the equivalent of at least a five-ton on-road or even seven-ton up. So it's a big difference on that. People are like, yeah, my truck will carry this much. Yeah, but try bouncing up through the rocks or this or that and see what breaks. So that MOG is rated for that kind of weight carrying capacity. It doesn't hurt it. The drivetrain does not need to be modified other than increased horsepower, and then we do like an overdrive system on it for just uh, better highway cruising and lower RPM, more quiet, less heat generated for your AC, it doesn't have to fight. So we don't need to beef up the axles, we don't need to beef up the transmission, it's already there. Uh, parts availability from Merck is unparalleled, I get stuff any, it's coming from Germany but it could go anywhere in the world. And these particular vehicles are older series machines. You know, they're pre uh, computer controlled anything. And we specifically go after that just for that bulletproof reliability. You don't have to have a diagnostic scanner set up or whatnot. You don't have to worry about in 15 years that sensor is no longer available for this one. This one is purely mechanical, and the Germans have got a soft spot for the Unimog. In fact, uh, a couple years ago, I had a uh, 1976 old series fire truck with a very rare option mechanical exhaust brake like you literally hit a linkage for this thing with your heel we broke it because it was corroded looked on the german uh computer epc electronic parts catalog in stock from germany flew it over we had it so parts availability off-road mobility um durability i reluctantly hate saying that i don't like saying this but i crashed one of these uh, about seven months ago nose diving to a 12-foot vertical top in frozen ground broke my hand, just about went through the windshield, this, that. If I was in my 4500 or anything like that, I would completely total the truck. All I did is I crunched in this fender, didn't even break the windshield, put a couple dents on where the cage was on that thing. And that was it, we literally craned it out. If I would have had the fender on hand, we would have had it back up and running in a week. I'm still driving that truck today, it's one of my favorite yeah. trucks. Extremely durable, uh, extremely robust, uh, and then People always say they don't need this kind of off-road capability. Like, well, you just haven't been there yet. You know, if you're not used to it, if you don't know where you can go, you're kind of limiting half the deal. And then for those guys that for sure aren't ever going to go there, when you sink a 10, 15, 20,000 pound vehicle by sand, it's a big deal. 
you were going to be thanking me when all of a sudden you're going down, you're two feet deep, and you're still slugging through this wash in the beach that you didn't know was there. And part of that's really because of the both portal axles, but also the central tire inflation, which portal axles, of course, enable. So while driving, right, you hit that beachy area, one right from the cab, lower the tire pressure right down to a whatever the right tire pressure is for that soft, sandy condition, and you ride right through it. You nailed it. And it is a huge deal. People who say they don't want to see tires don't understand. If you own more than two or three vehicles like me, don't buy it because you got to have it on every vehicle. Washboard roads. If it's washboarding me around, I'll bring it down to silence it out. If I get a heavy crosswind, I'll start overinflating the rear axle to help stabilize that through there. If I'm really hyper mileaging it, maybe I'll overflate it. Or if it's a little bit bumpy, that's just the on road aspect of it. The off road is limitless. And the main reason you get stuck off road is because you don't want to get out and air down your. Because it takes 40, 45, it takes so long yeah, to yeah, air them down and air them back up, and oh, you're sitting in the dirt. Yeah, here you're doing it right from the comfort of the cab while moving. It's like putting on tire chains. You're like, oh, I know I need them, but maybe I can get through it. Mm. And then all of a sudden you don't. And now you're an 18,000 pound vehicle on the axles as well. So even if you don't have the CTIS on this vehicle, you still have the ground clearance of, so let's just say this is a 46 inch tire and with at least a four inch drop, we're affording the clearance of basically a 54 inch tire because the center of that axle is brought up above. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Yeah, so you can see this here. Now, I'm not a big guy, but I mean, I could literally <laughs> go in the shade here and, and take a look. I can literally <laughs> sit under the dip. I mean, come on, who do you know? I mean, what rig is that? So if I have to work on it, it's a lot easier. That's the hardest thing is finding a creeper that has a lift kit on it. <laughs> right, that's pretty amazing. So it's a big deal. On that. <laughs> that is. Now, Jay, while we're in the front here and you're you're getting out of the dirt there, let's also talk about the dual winch setup here because that is definitely interesting and it's it's a uh, it's intriguing, right? It's, I think yeah. it's a great idea. So tell us tell us more why you know this works so well. That's a really big question we get asked all the time. We don't do it just because more is better. We do it because we could have done a much larger winch on here to handle the capacity of these two smaller winches. These are 17,000 pound hydraulic winches. This will out pull my 25,000 pound electric winch. Just, it just does, the hydraulics are always strong. But, and hydraulics are standard on all the Unimogs for the most part? Most nope, of them, but okay. It is definitely an option that could be put on. A lot of the mogs have them and a lot of them don't. So mm -hmm. that's kind of when you're shopping, you really gotta figure it okay. out. We, we could retrofit them all, pretty much all. But here's the beauty with this. 17,000 pound winch is not nearly enough to get this truck out. So we have twin 17s and a 25 in the rear. Most of the time, you just need a little bit of help to get you off something or over something. You just run one. It's easy. When you're pulling out your anchor, because it's too much, now I've got a second winch that I hook onto something else. The other deal is... So you could run one winch to one tree, one to a boulder over here, or another tree. So you're spreading out the load on, on your anchors. That's correct. Yeah. Also, because I'm using two smaller winches, my tackle could be normal people tackle. I could go to a guy with a Land Rover or a Cruiser or a Jeep and utilize his same tackle. <clears throat> the big winch in the rear, it's big stuff. It's dangerous. The big winches get, they're dangerous. The powering force is generated from hydraulic pressure is incredible. So, most of the time, one winch will do it. But when you need two, we've now doubled our pulling capacity and doubled our grabbing. I could then double each line. That gives me a total of about 64,000 pounds out of these two winches. Two right. Well, and also gives you some redundancy, too, just in case you have some point of failure. Because stuff always fails. The rear winch, if it fails, we've actually got this one plumb where I can basically. I'm going to go to a removable shackle so I can feed this through, drop it, and run it underneath. Just as an absolute get out of jail card. Right. And with so much room underneath because of the portal axles, that yep. 20 it inches actually, of clearance. It runs right through this little groove here. Yeah. Goes right on the side of the differential and then runs right down under there. I have, right. The reason I say this is I've done this with steel rope before in the mountains, sliding down the ice. It works with that. With synthetics, just that much better. And then we go with a. Uh, we go with a secondary braided uh, synthetic winch line. Jury's out on that. It gives me some more durability. Mm -hmm. But the beauty is redundancy, pulling capacity. This will pull out any, like nothing is even close to that. And then again, like I said, it had a 25,000 pound rear. Um, we did that mostly because so the hydraulic system to do this is a little bit complicated. You have to separate your hydraulic pressures and flow. Uh, it's kind of like an open differential. You gotta lock the diff. You have to have the same amount of CCs going to each one. But then when you do that, you also slow down each winch. The new uh, Rectroff valving we have has a priority control, which will give you full flow to this one, or it'll split it in half, or it'll split it into thirds, or direct again to whichever one needs all the flow. So the reason that's important 
is because it's mosquitoes suck, man. It seems like every time I get stuck, I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. So, and these are also a two speed. So one of the things you end up finding out, which we're gonna teach on a class on Sunday here for heavy vehicle extraction, is you often find yourself rewinding winches. And if you're not, you haven't done a big vehicle because if you're not a big one, you're done. So this one, you put it in a high speed and literally it's like hauling ass. <laughs> so these will have a remote control set up into them as well currently. Uh, it's just the dash control, but the remote control will plug in right over here. So you can, if you're Han Solo, like I often am, um, <laughs> So the witches are really cool. That's great. And uh, I could show, I could, you want to see a little secret why portals work so good in soft material? Sure. I don't think anyone knows this. So let me uh, show you why they work. You got to look at the vehicle from this angle here. So remember, we have a, here's the center of our wheel. Here's the bottom of my differential right up here. The normal truck, the bottom of my differential is right here. Okay, so that's going to be the bottom of a big diff on a big truck. But, but mine's up here. When I'm sinking into the sand, so we're going to look at this clockwise, is I'm driving forward here. When I'm peeling out in my truck, this material here and here, as I move it back, I'm lowering the truck. I'm getting deeper and deeper. Remember, I can only go this deep before I'm axle deep and high centered. So this material here, I'm just digging a hole, digging a hole, digging a hole. Boom, I'm high centered. Remember, on the MOG, our axle's up here. So I could... I could keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper till I get to this leading face, this three o'clock face here. Now, if you look at my road, look what's going on. I'm not going, I'm not digging like this anymore. I'm digging like this. I'm trying to climb my way out. So what will happen, it'll take down, the tread will take down the material in front of you, remove that material, fill these cleats, which then will not dig down any deeper here because you already filled that void, deposit behind you. I'll be going through soft material literally like this like it's hitting these steps and fenders and i'm slowly clawing through clawing through till eventually it grabs something and it will you'll watch a mog in deep sand the altar or wherever oh you're like oh god don't bury don't bury but you're already buried 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 also it just goes it's because of that location and where the portal is my g-wagon i have portal axes on i would always get stuck always get stuck not because it's a bad vehicle but just because we're doing extreme stuff when I put portals on it, I would literally go in soft sand, straight up something, it's heavy rig. I get lower and lower to the point where I felt like I could touch the ground, blah, 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 and then it would pop up and get out. And that was only because of the portals. Yeah, that so is cool. That's the trick. And you have such a nice uh, uh, guard here, too, over the yep. central tire inflation connection that, that you've designed. It's really beautiful. Yeah, so you do, we're doing a billet aluminum wheel through here. So that's just a Hutchinson wheel. Um, what's beautiful with this system is... These are just great wheels to begin with, but we have space for one wheel in the rear on the carrier, and then the roof rack is going to carry just the actual rubber tire itself. So with the tools that we have you set up, the cordless tools you have set up, pop the 24 bolts off, pop the ring off. So you get a blowout, now you're freaking out because you have no spare. So you drive that day, you've got your spare on, everything's good. Once you've gotten to a place where you're comfortable, you're not freaked out and everything's safe, now you kick the tire down from the roof or the crane, whatever we provide with you. Get your dead one, discard the old carcass, undo these, slide the new tire on. You don't have to have tire levers. You don't have to worry about breaking your back. I mean, it's still heavy, but... And now you have a spare mounted and ready to rock and roll. And in the meantime, you can start hunting down your next spare tire. And by not carrying the full spare on the roof, these are just heavy. So we're trying to decrease that weight carrying capacity. Because like I kind of initially mentioned, we really target that 18,000 pound mark. Some guys are going to be like, oh, what a pig. My Jeep weighs this much. Well, sorry, dude. That's just what it weighs to have a house and something that can carry it. You just look at a basic LMTV, uh, cabin chassis over 18. Uh, put a house on it, you got another 8,000 on that. You do a 6x6 six six, with houses 28,000. My 6x6 six six Unimog weighs 31 empty. So I get to these things, it's like a Suzuki Samurai. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and again, the power to weight ratio. Uh, this truck was a high horror horsepower option at 214 to 15 horse this one is set at 270 i'm going to go ahead and give it the, i gave it the green light to go to 320 these are used vehicles so we proactively go through and exchange things on them but i don't just crank the fuel up on these things and send them off we do our modifications we make sure everything's solid and the truck likes it and everything's happy so i'm giving this the green light to 320 320 runs cool efficient fuel economy with this parachute it's going to be a tough one to call. I don't think we're going to break 10 miles a gallon. It could definitely be down to the 8.6. But I do know if we didn't have that tall box on there, if it was one that was maybe 12 inches higher, I would be no less than 10 and no better than 
it won't hit 13, it'll probably hit 12, and that's at 65 plus miles an hour. That's impressive. And what year of Unimog is this? 96. The 96. So 96. Mm -hmm. This particular, these two particular builds are twins. Uh, the way they came off the assembly line, they have a lot of options that we already liked on them. Um, we have a working gear group, so that gives me around a 680 to one first gear. Um, it has a much larger clutch that also has an air assist. So us, we, me guys, have had too many operations. It's like buttery smooth, but it's this clutch is massive. Um, so you're not going to smoke it. That's great. Let's take a look at the the sure. the wheel travel over here. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. So what so what do we have here? This is the twin of the other one. So it's also a 1996 or around there? Okay. Exact same trucks for the most part. But that is a different box. Than this, one. this box, building a box for this guy. Hey, we're doing a covered wagon setup so we can put his can am or whatever in there. <laughs> but but the bed sides come off, the headboard comes off, there's going to be a large passer, and then we're doing a low profile, high low box for this guy. Much lighter, and it'll also be a foot longer than his brother over here. So this is going to be nicer in the winds. This is going to be nicer to keep it through the small trees, etc., etc. Still a forge of downwards of the other one, but when you, you do have a compromise, when you do a high low setup, you either gain weight or if it's flat or top, it's obvious you compromise there. But this guy's probably going to fall down yeah, around the world. Right? He's crazy. So I'm like, so right on, man. <laughs> Israel loves company, right? <laughs> so, uh, and look at this this wheel travel. It's really it's really quite impressive when you uh, the way you have it set up right here. So once we put something heavy in the back of it too, how much it'll actually really twist is pretty good. Uh, Mercedes engineers, I believe it's 2.2 million, uh, 2.2 degrees of wheel travel per meter of wheelbase. So we're able to calculate how much flex needs to go to everything. But the way the body is designed and the rear body is designed is a free floating torsion free deal. So every single vehicle here is typically mounted, the body mounts to the frame, and the body gives some of the strength to the frame. That's why things pop and twist. So you gotta make things look flexy and light or they crack. With the Unimog, it's completely a free floating system. Therefore, the bodies will live forever. I mean, to, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but a lot of these bodies out here, you know, if I see them in 20 years after hard off-road use, I'll be very impressed. I know for a fact I'll absolutely see these because I have some trucks 30-something years old with a very rigid box structure, meaning rigid, not complacent to being able to be flexed, like they're going to fail, that are flawless and perfect. So that's due to the uh, climate. And, you know, I just had a uh, conversation with a guy from Oshkosh. Who, this is for this is the independent versus solid axle crew out there. So I'm gonna get a lot of hate hate about this, but the independent is great speed, obviously. You can't beat the ride. There's a lot of good things about it, but the negative. Obviously, you have a lot of moving parts and things to fail. There, that's a given. People will argue that doesn't fail. Everything fails in my world. So, but what really comes into play is once you put a big heavy house on this, and you start getting to this twisty terrain. When you push one up on this. It just, it literally is forcing the other one down. It's always forcing it down. It's trying to come up with an equilibrium. Keep this in mind. I've got a rock here where my differential is, tires here. If I could just compress, so I'm going over two rocks, I could compress this up, I still have a rock hitting that diff. The main issue, that's not a big deal, but I have had that where I'll, I'll ping a diff. The big issue is, when I go with an independent setup, even if you disconnect your sway bar, you still gotta have a certain amount of spring to hold that thing up. And this one's just kinda doing its own. That's why it's independent. It'll go up and it'll pitch, it'll it'll sky my whole truck up. This one's going to be in the air. And I get into this weird teeter-totter thing going on where it's a little bit, it's kind of violent when it wants to give this give over because it's always pushing off. These legs are always trying to push off. You don't believe me? Go watch a Razor with, you know, high-end shut coil -ups. Oh, They're always pushing off. And I don't care what you do, that's always the case with an independent. So the solid axle reliability with the portal axle, it's just beyond me. I didn't touch on the portal axle as well. Sorry to stray on this. It's a 2.2 to 1 gear reduction in this hub assembly. So my axle is just seeing less than half the torsional load than what is being actually applied out here. So you can do that on an independent. And I'm not knocking independent stuff for lightweight trucks. I have big. I have a, a 10 ton, 10 by 10, uh, 7 ton, 6 by 6 with independent. They work well, but I still run into those situations where I'm kind of doing that weird thing. Where, again, when I load my big 10 ton truck, my clearance will never get lower than that differential except for tires. When I load that 10 ton, the diff is getting lower every time. So when you got a house on an independent truck, um, you've just sacrificed that much clearance because that's your preload right there. Right. So 
everything's got a give and take, and that's just the give, and you know, the take is it's pretty good man i don't know <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I, I can attest to that i was super impressed with that rough uh washboard road with curves and dips in it and we were going down at about 60 miles an hour and it, and it just stuck to it and it was smooth as can be and there was never any rattles no uncomfortable like yeah sliding or bouncing or skittering which you know i can get that in my in my you know sprinter van at 10 or 20 miles an hour right yeah yeah having 46s and being able to drift at 40 a uh, 14,000 pound truck, it's not real. I mean, I, I, I've done a fair bit of racing and whatnot. I'll overshoot a corner on a big gravel road and I've literally gone through huge ditches and just kept clearing out the ditch, trying to correct it mm -hmm. instead of tumbling. So they're just very robust, very reliable. And and when I rode it with Jay uh, in his in one of his Unimogs, uh, it was really impressive. You actually took us through a ditch at pretty good speed. I want to say it was probably about oh, 25 yeah. or so miles an hour and we went a diagonally across this pretty deep ditch, maybe about a six or seven foot deep ditch, something like that, and probably about 20 feet across or so, 15, 20 feet across, and we went through it, what, 25, 30 miles an hour? Barely even felt it, right? It was just a little bit of a jog each side, and there was no, nothing scary. It was, it was just smooth as can be. It was really, it was super impressive. It's solid. The, uh, the negative, the only negative I have with tall trucks is you have that inverted pendulum effect. You swing around, you get into a Jeep, it's like riding on a magic car. But here's the positive of that. Your visibility is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, look at this hood. I mean, you have, what, maybe two and a half, three feet between, like, the front of the bumper to the windshield, right? Beautiful. So, this is actually really cool. It's a good, this is cab over versus uh, mog over. Very short nose in order to make use as much area we can bed, but it still puts me behind the axle instead of in the front of the axle. In front of the axle, I'm getting sprung up like the back end of a school bus. Period. That's just how they all are. The other thing is, I didn't realize this until maybe seven years ago, doing some stuff down in Mexico, come around some blind corners in, a, in one of my G-Wagons, waiting for that oncoming car to smack me. And normally I'm in these. I'm like, oh, it's going to suck if I hit somebody. In that one, I'm like, I'm going to die if I hit somebody. <laughs> so having the elevation above them and having a thousand pound engine in front of me just to kind of soften up the load that I'm going through, it's a big deal because accidents happen. It could be an animal. It could be a tree. It could be a who knows. So visibility protection to yourself um, deep water fording if any of you guys haven't gone through a river that's you see these river crossings like oh that was like two feet deep no big deal well trust me when the entire earth has gotten like this to you thing you freak out hard so having that extra bit of clearance and everything else just affords you that you're not going to freak out and it just allows you to get through through those water crossings people say they're not going to but often i will come across a, a crossing in south america that will afford me, I either go through the water or I take two and a half days the long way of nothing but hell. Or maybe it's a, a bad sure. area I don't want to drive through. And I remember in my old Land Rover days, having Land Rover Discoveries, Range Rovers, and Defenders, you know, you're pretty high up, but going through some pretty deep water crossings. I remember one where the water came up over the hood, and, you know, that it's a pretty long, it was a long water crossing, so we're getting pushed down river a little bit, but eventually water starts sneaking in through the doors, right, through the door seals. And so, like, the vehicle's fine. It's still protruding forward. It's, it's going to make it across the river, but meanwhile, you get across with soggy carpets inside, right? So having this elevated up definitely, you know, gives you that much more comfort that if you got stuck or if you had to take your time getting across you're not going to get that water intrusion through the door seals you, you nail that and then we do a drivetrain pressurization system for others. so axles torque tube drive shaft transmission everything has about half a bar of pressure so call it seven and a half eight psi for deep water fording to keep that water out of it and the other nice thing that you were just talking about on deep water fording is because the bodies of these mods are so high in the center with the portal and everything else you get pushed downstream that way that thing going through most of the water is going underneath me. So it takes a lot to get it off because as you go through there, your wake is coming up over the hood and it literally is kind of coming back together right about here on you. And if you have a pretty good flow, it's pushing up a little tighter, but most of it's still free flowing underneath me. If I got a low rider vehicle, I'm trying to make a wall across this <laughs> flowing water and it's just going to keep moving me down. So, and I've experienced it. It's, it's pretty frightening because you, you think you're pointing towards the end of the river, but eventually you're going 45 degrees up the river oh, to be able to make it across. Really. Yeah. We had um, a big flood up here a few years ago. We salvaged a bunch of people, 20-something um, people, a dozen cats and dogs. I literally had water coming up to my mirror here. We had uh, the, uh, the emergency rescue had a Zodiac boat. This is the ultimate compliment. Right? Got to my own horn here. Zodiac boats trying to go up the road. The road is just like a plastic rapids now. They look at me like, can you tore a boat up that? 
<laughs> we actually hit water at like three or four miles an hour. The water's up over here, but it actually splashed over the top of the mod and was hitting the people in the back, <laughs> just like going through this flood. So maybe you're not an emergency relief worker, but emergencies happen and to be able to have your home on that, because this is your home. This is, this is all you got if you're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I guess you got your help and whatnot, but it really sucks banning a trip somewhere in Africa only to find out that you just gave it all up and you're going to try it on motorcycles next time? I don't know, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Jay, thank you so much for your time today here at Overland Expo in Loveland, Colorado. It's been great talking to you again, and thanks for sharing so much about all your knowledge and experience, cool. and, and especially with these, these Unimogs. It's really cool. great. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, good one. Awesome. Thank you.